responsive to Psalm 33. The word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the Lord stand in awe of him. Blessed is the nation who goes out to the Lord. The people of the church is next to the Lord of the earth. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. To, to deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive from famine. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our strength and our shield. Our hearts shall rejoice in the Lord because he has trusted his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we trust in you. Second lesson is from Romans 8. Dear Christian friends, you have no obligation whatsoever to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you keep on following it, you will perish. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you turn from your sinful nature and its evil deeds, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves. You should behave instead like God's very own children, adopted into his family, calling him Father, dear Father. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we are God's children. And since we are God's children, we will share his treasures. For everything God gives to his Son, Christ, is ours too. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Third lesson is from John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish, Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform these signs that you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? Not one has ever gone to heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to, sa but to save the world through Him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Conversation with Nicodemus is another one of those places in Scripture where you have all three persons of the triune Godhead mentioned, with no explanation provided of who Jesus is exactly going to talk about. He mentions the Holy Spirit as the wind that can't be seen, and he prays to God and calls himself the Son of Man, which was a biblical term for the uh, Messiah, so it's continued to be a festival. Every few years I preach a sermon about the Trinity. This morning I'm not going to. We're trying to get through Romans. And we are in deep in a very dark final part of Romans. So bear with me, class. <clears throat> we, of course, are talking about election, predestination, and foreknowledge and all the things that people in the church have argued about for 2,000 years. 
is quote, like every truth about God, like every truth about God, the doctrine of election involves mystery. And here's an eye opener. It sometimes involves controversy. Oh, really? Denominations have been started on this doctrine. Uh, churches have split wide open. There are people who don't go to this church now because they think we're too much about election. Uh, and there are some people who don't come because we're not enough. We're not Presbyterian enough. It goes on and on. But let me remind you, church, the doctrine of election was not invented by Augustine or by John Calvin or even by R.C. Sproul. The election is presented explicitly throughout Scripture, and nearly all Christians, even our free will, Arminian brothers and sisters, accept election when it is used to describe God's sovereign choice of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Apostle Paul for his specific purpose for each one of those men. Those are the four poster boys for election in the scriptures. God chose them out of millions for a specific purpose. It is only when predestination and what John Calvin and his Calvinists decided to call unconditional election, only when they are applied to the salvation of every sinner who has ever come to God through faith in Jesus Christ that sparked me. Now, I'll give one person one one minute opportunity to defend the doctrine of election for salvation. Well, I'll give you one, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and that, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Finish that? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath what? Before ordained, before, or before he became a Christian. God had to work for you that we should walk in. Uh, that's the biblical explanation. There are many others, but uh, you know, when you take out and the, the problem with I love doctrine. See, the problem is your, your pastor is a doctor of monk. I love this stuff, but you don't have to have any opinion on election to be a happy Christian. You don't have to have one. You don't have to know all the scholarly stuff written about election. And predestination. And there's, if you shake a, you shake a tree near a Christian bookstore, 50 books on the election fall out. Uh, pro and con. You don't have to read those to be a happy Christian. Now, doctrine is something that we are encouraged, that I encourage the church and always have, to wade into because the more we know about it, and I believe, the more completely new creatures we become. But there are some Christians, and God bless them, I love them who are so hung up on doctrine that they totally forget about Jesus' main point, which was not doctrinal. What was the new and great commandment of Jesus in the scriptures? Learn all you can. Go to seminary. Get a degree. What was it? A new commandment I give to you. In so many words, the 11th commandment is this. What was it? That you love one another. Even as I have loved you. I'm about to Give my life for you. Even as I love you, you should love one another. And then he added this. By this, not by how much you know. Not by what you, how you stand on election or free will or creation or anything else. By this, by your love for one another, shall all men know what? You are my disciples. Yeah, that guy is a disciple of Christ. He is so smart. No. That guy is a disciple of Christ. He loves them. So, as I get excited about this stuff and you start to yawn, I'm sorry, we're preaching through Romans, and Romans is a doctrinal epistle if there ever was one. But remember, these things are good to know. But how you stand on election right now, we all straightened out before the Lord. And until then, 
Just be the best Christian you can. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Memorize John 3.16. We've heard it twice today. And love one another. So with that preach while I continue. Now, if you really want to get a shouting watch start, shouting match started in the church, just bring up the dark side of the election with some clever person called double election. It goes like this. Okay, you election monk. If God, way back at the dawn of time, predestined those whom he would elect for salvation, were not all those at the same time whom God did not elect for salvation, thereby predestined for damnation. Yikes. Now, that's a problem with doctrine. Doctrine's an attempt to take the mysteries of Scripture and to condense them into some logical, quotable, printable sense. And you can't always do that. Because that logic is undeniable, but we don't like to think. If you weren't chosen, he doesn't have a chance. And that doesn't sit well with Christians at all. I'm not sure it should sit well with us. It should bother us. In Romans, though, in Romans 9 to 11, this doctrinal section we're wading through, Paul is not talking about the salvation of individuals. He's talking about God's election of Israel. And that's pretty hard to deny. Out of all the nations of the earth at that time, God chose Abraham. And through him, Israel to affect his will for history. That's mystery enough. It's still controversial. As we continue this morning in Romans 9, we'll find Paul defending divine God's divine authority, and vindicating, if you will, God's unfettered sovereignty in electing Israel. As he does so, however, he will leave himself open to our questions about election in general. Here are our questions. How does or how did God choose his elect? When does God or when did God choose men? Is there any place for the free will of the called in election? Are those whom God calls required to say yes? Or to do anything? Agree with God even? Can the called decline their calling? Or change their mind at some later date. All those things swirling about this pulpit. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to get hung up on that. We don't want to ignore it either. We are here, Father, to fellowship and to sit under the ministry of your word in order that we might be refreshed, instructed, and equipped to live the next week. To your glory. And to the blessing of others. And so, Father, I pray that you would the lips of your servant and the ears of this church that we might hear what you want us to hear regarding us and our relationships and our attitudes and our plans in the midst of this doctrinal, academic, but important stuff. Guide us and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to Romans 9. And I'll begin at verse 14. Now, remember from last week, I hope that Paul was talking about the choice of Isaac over Ishmael. It certainly wasn't fair to Ishmael, from our perspective. God's choice of Isaac over Esau, even though Esau was the firstborn. And then Paul anticipates this question in verse 14. Then what shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, God says to Moses, and here he quotes from Exodus 13, Exodus 33, I think. God told Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. In, in many ways, that's God saying, how I work is none of your business. That's all Now in that quotation, Moses 
or to, to Moses, God is talking about his choice of Israel over Edom. Edom were the descendants of Esau. And I have chosen Israel for my reasons. And I have compassion on Israel for my reasons. Now, he didn't abandon Edom. He didn't abandon Esau. But he had a different plan. He had a special plan for Israel. Paul continues in verse 16, It is not, therefore, dependent on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, here Paul is all over the Israeli historic, historical map. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, God telling Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he will have, he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Now I'll stop there for just a moment. Is God unfair? Paul answers unequivocally, no, not at all. But his follow-up explanation makes you ask more questions. He follows up with that this is about God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and compassion on whom I'll have compassion. And we go back a little bit in Romans 9, we find out at least, why God elects. He makes his choices in order that his purposes in election might stand through. God, should, God has, I believe this, God has a plan for your life. And he has a plan for the world. And God's plan is moving according to God's timetable and under God's authority and it drives us crazy because the world is so messed up. God insists in this word that he's moving time according to his schedule in the direction that he wants. In every choice he makes, whether it's the nation or whether it's a person in the sanctuary, he makes toward that end. That the purpose of his election might stay. Okay? Get our heads around that. Edwards writes, election is how God separated the nation of Israel, the thread of Israel, through which he would fulfill his promises. Don't forget, Jesus came through Israel. From the fabric of all the nations, his specific choices within history, however vexing they are to us, are made in keeping with his sovereign purpose in history, the salvation of his elect, and the reconciliation of all creation back to himself. And Paul reminds us that this has nothing to do with whether or not you want to be chosen or you work in order to be rewarded as being. All depends, Paul says, on God's mercy. Mercy is the power that fuels election. And you look just under the under the cover, and he said, What about those people who weren't chosen? Where's mercy there? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion it has nothing to do with justice. Folks, if it did, none of us would stand a chance. Romans is lousy with those references. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that is righteous. No, not one. There is no one doing good. No one seeking God. No one. And so if God's basis for salvation were justice, nobody would be. So those who are elected, we don't know who they are. I assume you might be. I assume maybe you are, but I don't know. Guess is that you are because election plays out in how you live your life, right? Listen, God has never elected, and I keep using that word because Paul does, God has never elected a person for salvation whose life isn't changed. It never doesn't take effect. You might have gone down the aisle and said some words after the pastor, and you might have a, a baptism certificate somewhere in your father cabinet that says you accepted Jesus on some day in the in history, but unless your life is lived with all its ups and downs and ins and outs and sidetracks and bad years, is trajected toward holiness, is trajected toward your being less like your old self and more like Christ in little ways, you weren't chosen by God for anything. He just said some words. God's word does not return to him void. So your salvation 
the genuineness of it is not whether you're Presbyterian, whether you believe in election, or whether you're a Methodist and believe in free will. Whether you go to even a little church in Roarsville, your salvation is a matter of for my, how I see you live your life. And even as that happens, God says, don't you dare judge that person. You'll know. You'll know. So that dark side shows up again in verse 17. Now Paul talks about Moses and Pharaoh. You know that story, right? The story of the plagues. The story of Moses. You know, Moses was also chosen. Moses was chosen by God to lead his people out of 400 years of Egyptian bondage. A million people, we think, across the wilderness to Canaan, the land promised in God's covenant with Abraham centuries before. Moses was elected to do that. But then Paul tells us in so many words that God also elected Pharaoh not to be saved, but to be a stumbling block. This is where it gets tricky. Paul 9, verse 16. No, verse uh, 17. The scripture says, Paul writes to Pharaoh, I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. He hardens whom he wants to harden. Now, what is that harden talking about? Okay, you've heard the phrase. Well, can anybody describe a hard-hearted person? What's a hard-hearted person? Anyone been jilted by one? A hard-hearted person? What's a hard-hearted person? A person that has no feelings, man! They have no feelings. They don't get me. They don't understand how hurtful that is. They don't hear me when I talk to them. This is a scriptural phrase. Hard hardness. The heart can be hardened, the Bible. And the question for theologians to get around in single classrooms is this. Did God harden Pharaoh's heart? I, I can take you to scriptures that are right there in your notes. In Ephesians 4, 21, 7, 3. Uh, pardon me, Exodus 4, 21, 7, 3, 9, 12, 10, 1. All of those verses say God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But then, you can ask this question. Wait a second. Didn't Pharaoh harden his own heart? Didn't your old boyfriend harden his own heart? You didn't harden it for him, did you? Well, those who believe that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, they can go to Exodus 7 and Exodus 8 and Exodus 9 and Exodus 35, where he says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. You have two choices. Throw our Bibles in the fire or wrestle with this without ever knowing if we're getting it. Derek, speak. Oh, there's a commercial I see on TV every now and then. About Pharaoh? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> okay. And, and it, 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 it's people. Uh, 50 and up age, it, it, or maybe in the age of yeah. freedom and okay, you know, all that. And, and the, uh, there is a vaccine or a treatment of sort, an injection that you can get for, I believe it's hepatitis. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's A, B, or C, but it, it, it slowly destroys your liver. It lives in your body, even if you don't have any other symptoms. And it eventually it kills you. And it's almost a heart attack. But do you think anybody will die of hepatitis this year? There is the cure, and it's a very good cure. It's amazing to me. You think anybody will die? Did anyone cause them to die because they created that vaccine? Certainly not. This year, there'll be like 23,000 people die of influenza. Suppose I had a vaccine that was equally effective, 100% effective. I bet you half of those would still die. So the same thing is true. God's given us the cure. I mean, this is, this is an argument against the dark side. God has given us the cure, but Paul goes out in a general sort of fashion, and I guarantee you, a lot of them are going to die in the long run. They won't go to heaven. They won't see eternity in bliss. So it's going to see eternity and, and under the wrath of God's judgment, okay? Because it, the cure is there. It was not taken away from them. It, it was given to them. Bibles, you can get free, okay? Just like you can get an influenza vaccine free, okay? But they'll still not go to heaven. Why? All of them because they weren't chosen. Because they weren't chosen. That's, that's, no, no, that's I'm, true. But I, by the way, in a minute, I'm going to refer all the questions, but I'd like to, too, Eric, still after the service. There's still free will. 
upon those who die. Okay, that's, that's Eric second. Thank you. Uh, here is uh, Stuart Briscoe's. Over and again, Pharaoh is moved by the momentous events that overtake him. Remember, plague after plague, Pharaoh says, okay, okay, enough, I'll let him go, and then it's, he changes his mind. And another plague would come. Again and again, he was overtaken by the momentous events in his life, only to revert, once the effects wore off, to his arrogant attitude of resistance to God's demands. Repeatedly, he hardens his heart until finally God hardens it for him. That's first verse. It would appear in Pharaoh's case that God placed this man in his position of international visibility so that when his own hard-heartedness came into conflict with God's purpose, he would become an international illustration of the futility of arrogantly opposing the purposes of God and in the process provide a demonstration of God's divine power. The freedom to do this, Scripture insists, is then controvertibly God's. Okay, Paul continues, if God, just in case God did, if God hardened Pharaoh's heart, if God elected Pharaoh to be an obstacle for Moses and the Israelis, then how can God blame them for responding to their election? That's a darn good question. How could God blame them if he decided this was going to happen? Does he make this happen in so many ways? And Paul's answer will not satisfy anybody. And that is where the mystery lies. Okay, let's turn back to Romans 9. And here's how Paul answers that excellent question. I'm in verse 20. Who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special use and some for common use? Yeah, the answer to those questions is yes, but you're not answering my question, Paul. Why does God? I don't I have no idea, church. Somehow in God's sovereignty, there is, as Eric described, a working by which those who are exposed to the gospel in a sermon or in a radio sermon or reading the scriptures or reading a book are pricked by the Holy Spirit, given the faith to believe and accept the promise and become the creatures of Christ. And there's others read the same material, hear the same sermon, hear the same sermons, go to the same church, or the same preacher, in the same book and go, yeah, that's not working for me. It's a mystery. And I love all those who say, well, obviously it's the choice of the person who reads it. You've got to, you've got to sacrifice a little intellect to take some of these things on faith, you know, the Bible is pretty fantastic. And I'm friends with those who say, well, if God pushes your button, you get it. If he doesn't, you don't. It's that stark. And I don't pretend to understand. It's in Scripture, you have to believe it. But how it works, I don't know. I know one thing, as Paul says, answers, is God unjust? Absolutely not. Cannot be. His holiness won't stand for it. So it is a mystery that we are allowed to wrestle with, but I invite you not to, to, to start a new church over. It's been done too many times already. Now, anybody want to add some wisdom? Or some more unanswerable questions? Cowards. Thank you, Linda. Speak, girl. Yep. And even after I took it, I followed. You know what? Just losing the whole thing. Oh, thought it might have been. Nope, too bad. And I 
that it wasn't instant. I mean, all my problems still haven't gone away, yeah. but my temptation certainly didn't go away. And I kept giving in to them. Yeah. Really run my neck. <laughs> and I get it back in. You know. As much as you can count on one hand the number of Christians who've been through the ages, who when they hear a sermon that touches their heart say, hey, what? I guess I'm being elected. Wow. Cool. I have a It works. And, 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 and Paul talks about it matter-of-factly. And of course, theologians, bless their hearts, have to think about something. And so they write books and have classes in colleges and build seminaries and start denominations. They try to explain which is the explicable. <coughs> Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul told the Ephesian, the Ephesian jailer. And you will be saved, you and your home. That's all you have. And if God wants to make you a seminary professor later in life, and you can discuss the election with your students, excellent. And like I said, I love this stuff. I read about it constantly. But it's no less a mystery than the Trinity, which we don't argue about too much. Um, and do you have anyone else? Katie, you're about to say something. Well, I just keep thinking of our friend Kylie, who was baptized here. Yes, she was. And her story was just, you know, she, the last thing she wanted to be was really just plucked her out of this pagan yep. faith that she was in. Right. I just, when, when that was happening, I was thinking of these verses. You know, it's really, really powerful. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's worth thinking about and wrestling with. I mean, I think God blesses us in our striving to understand mysteries, even if you don't get to the bottom of them, which we never will until the end time. My fear is I'll get finally get before God you know, in the last days and say, okay, Lord, what about the next says, I just have not talked about that today. <laughs> what? I'll be dragged away by the angels. He's taking the screen. I want to. I want to get the answer to that. He says he's still not here. Exactly. He said he'll never get it, Jeffrey. Says. Uh, it's fascinating, but you know, it, it all boils down to the sovereignty of God. If we believe that God is the one that we say we believe when we worship Him in our hymns and praise songs, as the sovereign, omniscient, omnipresent Creator of the world, if we believe that, then. Paul is right. We have little reason to say, how dare you, God? <laughs> I don't understand. Unless you let me make this clear, I'm going to only be fussy. Uh, uh, how dare you talk to me? How dare the, the clay? How dare the, the uh, piece of pottery that was made for a urinal complain to God that, hey, you made that beautiful vessel over there out of the same clay. Why this to me? You get it? How about the Christian who's living a life that's been broken? by physical illness or by injury or a soldier who was uh, uh, lost a leg or an arm in the war and come here. Paul was telling that person, don't ask God why. I, I have to ask God why. God may tell you why, and he may not. Will you live with that? Are you able to live with God's sovereignty? Now, we acknowledge it all the time. We sing about it every Sunday. But it's when it's visited in your life This is God's will for my life. Father, here's what I'd like to have now. I would like for this to change. I would like for this illness, which is so debilitating, to go away. I would like for this, listen, for this injury, which is so harmed my child. Then to say, nevertheless, not. That is faith. And that's what we're called upon to exercise in the face of mysteries and tragedies. And God says, He'll give us the grace we need to do it, even if we don't understand it. And so rather than launch into a 12 week study of election in Sunday school, He ask us to do it later. God chooses according to His purposes. God's word never returns to him void. And God's will will be done. Sometimes with your cooperation, sometimes without it. I do believe this. Once you come to God through faith in Christ, then you do have free will. You have free will to obey God, to follow God's commands, to love your enemy. Or not to. Uh, your fellowship with God will suffer if you disobey his desires, but free will, I think, is a post-salvation phenomenon, not a pre-salvation. But that's all I'm going to say about that. Let's close with John. 
chapter 13. This is the familiar story of the Last Supper, which we are celebrating this morning. Jesus has just done the outrageous act of washing his disciples' feet one by one, washing their stinking, filthy feet one by one. You know, we do this once a year at our church. Uh, and you got to Peter, Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. You're Jesus and I'm not. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, relax. You don't understand this now, but you will. If I don't wash your feet, now you'll have a little part of it. Peter said, give me a bath in that case. And then Peter, is, he finishes washing Peter's feet. Verse, <clears throat> verse um, 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put his clothes on. Returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done to you? He asked them. And I'm sure there was this long, stony silence. We have no idea what you were doing. You call me teacher and Lord, and you do that rightly for that's what I am. So now that I have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. And not just once a year on Palm Sunday. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you. No servant is greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to all of you. Here's Jesus speaking, but I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Yes, Jesus said, I chose all you and disciples, and I chose you, Judas, to be my betrayer. I chose you to do that. Often when tones, did Judas Iscariot have God on the side? Was that doing God's will? Let's skip down to verse 34. A new command I give you, Jesus said, after all these difficult teachings, love one another as I have loved you, so you must Love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And as always, Peter had follow-up questions. Lord, where are you going? And Peter, Jesus said, so we were stopped asking my question. You don't know that. You don't need to know that. There are things you don't need to know. But there are things we need to know that God loves you and has a plan for your life. And it's anxious for you to get busy with it. You're not all in. And with that thought in mind, I say a word of prayer and table. We thank you, Lord, for holy mysteries. They give us things to think about and to pray about and to discuss with other Christians. But, Lord, the one great mystery that is made clear in the Scripture is that you love us and that you love the world you created and that you hate sin and hate the way it's corrupted the world you created. And that you have a fierce passion for your glory. And Lord, we want to glorify you in all we say in, you. in this building, in this room, outside this room, in our places of business, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. Thank you for loving us enough to send your son. And thank you, Father, for the gift of the communion table to remind us of our communion with you, with our Lord and Savior, with the Holy Spirit. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.